Okay, hello, good morning, good afternoon, and good evening, everyone. Uh, I think uh, we are uh, going to get uh, a few participants online. So now we reach uh, 70 people. And so I will then uh, start uh, our webinar. So um, welcome to all of you who are registered and are attending this first webinar of this year, 2022, organized by the One Health Social Sciences Initiative, an initiative launched and supported by the One Health Commission, which is a globally focused organization dedicated to implementing One Health and One Health actions around the world. The first webinar of this year is in fact also the first volume of a series on social sciences meeting One Health professional networks and communities of practice at the crossroads of health, the environment and the society. The aim of this series is mainly to discuss and learn about what is done elsewhere as a network or community of practice regarding One Health and the integration of social sciences and how One Health issues are act and activities are addressed with the use of social science. Among its foreseen objectives, we would like to illustrate inputs of social science in the One Health movement and its related activities in the field of research, policy, education. We also would like to promote the invited networks and their activities. We are going to network with other networks and as such, we are going to create uh, hopefully new collaborations. We also uh, can, uh, it's the, also the occasion to identify teams or topics for the new OHSS small working groups, which we will introduce to you today. And hopefully there will be much more for enforcing objectives coming up. So concretely, uh, I'm going, yeah. So the program of today, uh, which is going to last for one hour and maybe more uh, if, uh, if we have time. So it's to start with five minutes of announcement and introduction. So it's what I'm currently doing. Then uh, we will give the floor to our three invited panelists who are going to talk about the geo health community of practice using her observation data to inform health decision making with Dr. Uh, Elena Stapman. Uh, I'm just checking if you are still hearing something. Are you hearing? Uh, because I received messages that you are not hearing me. Yes, we hear, we hear. Oh, okay, perfect. Just to be sure. <laughs> Thank you. Okay, uh, so uh, the first uh, presentation, I, I mentioned it, then we will uh, have a talk about transdisciplinarity in the Belgium One Health Network uh, with Dr. Hans Kuhn from Belgium, and then we will have a presentation about the added value of social science for One Health Network coordination from uh, the Greece experience, so Greece stands for Management of Emerging Risk in Southeast Asia Network, uh, with uh, Dr. Aurélie Bino. After the five minutes uh, presentation each, we will launch a general discussion among them based on three prepared questions to guide us. So we will ask uh, how will they describe the contribution of the One Health Network during the COVID-19 pandemic? Also, how do they envision the future of the One Health Network over the next five years? And then what are their recommendations to better integrate social science in One Health research. Oh, sorry. Then the floor will be directly given to the audience for a question answer and a contribution session. And finally, we will then conclude uh, and close the webinar with the way forward. Sorry, I skipped uh, a bit of the slide. But by the way, uh, I'm myself, Severine Thais, uh, anthropologist from Belgium now based in France, working at CIRAD, uh, which is a French agricultural research center for international development. And also I'm a member of the OHSS leadership team. I will be uh, the moderator of this webinar, but together with my co-leaders, um, Dr. Veronica, which in fact uh, could not come because she got COVID and she's uh, not feeling well, but then we have our, the chair of our initiative, Dr. Bernardo Moreno, 
who is a medical doctor and social scientist from Mexico, currently doing his PhD at the University of California, Berkeley, in San Francisco. Um, we will then facilitate this one hour webinar. So for your information, this webinar is being recorded and will be available on the One Health Commission website in our uh, OHSS webinars library. For those attending the first time of webinars, I would like to say a few words on this initiative. So launched in 2017 to globally strengthen the One Health movement, OHSS provides a platform for innovation and integration of all social science disciplines to strengthen the network of individuals who incorporate social science concepts and methods in research uh, applications and community initiatives that link human, animal, and environmental health. We are indeed convinced that the social sciences are essential to understanding and addressing the root causes of disease and determinants of community health. Besides our webinars and in the spirit of remaining participative and initiate collaboration, we provided in 2021, last year, an action-driven opportunity for creating work groups with topics, format, aims of your own interest or need. After an online survey, a world cafe meeting and multiple email communication, three small working groups are born, uh, one on food systems and food security, one on pandemic control and one on infectious diseases. We cannot thank enough the colleagues who have helped develop the OHSA small work groups frameworks over the past few months. So thank you very much for that. Just a note is that there are two inactive uh, working groups at the moment, the climate change, environmental justice and the One Health Policy uh, group but uh, they can be reactivated pending uh, OHSS member interest. So you are really welcome uh, to contact us if you, you are interested in those uh, transversal topics. So finally, let me now introduce you properly. Uh, so first to Elena Chapman, physician and epidemiologist who is serving as the Associate Program Manager for Health and Air Quality Applications in the NASA Applied Science Program uh, at the NASA headquarters. She is currently also a member of the One Health Initiative Autonomous Pro Bono Team, member of the One Health Commission's uh, OHSS Leadership Team, and professorial lecturer in the Department of Environmental and Occupational Health at the Milken Institute School of Public Health at the George Washington University. Then Hans Kearns from Belgium is a political scientist and uh, with a PhD in environmental sciences. As a social scientist, he tries to work on one health complexity through transdisciplinary bridge building between scientific disciplines and professional communities and other stakeholders between science policy practice, between also different sectors, between key topics and normative perspectives. His motto is Rather embrace complexity in analytical deliberative approaches with all of its challenges than recreating reductionist islands which often only lead to dialogue of the deaf. And then uh, we have uh, today with us Aurélie Bino, who is a researcher at CIRAD uh, and also a co-director of the Maison des Sciences de l'Homme in Montpellier. Her scientific background is tropical agronomy and social anthropology. She is involved in several multidisciplinary research projects for a better understanding of health risk, perceptions across sectors, agriculture, health, environment, and for the implementation of participatory approaches within a One Health Eco Health framework for ecological and social transitions. And now I will uh, give the floor uh, to Elena Chapman with the first presentation. Please, Elena, we hear you. Hi, and thank you for this opportunity to form part of this esteemed panel with inspirational colleagues in One Health. It is an honor to also serve as a member of the One Health Initiative Autonomous Pro Bono Team and a member of the One Health Commission's One Health Social Science Initiative Leadership Team. I'm excited to be able to share this presentation on how Earth observations can contribute to expanding the scientific knowledge base and improve health decision making across an array of One Health applications. 
Next slide, please. So the World Health Organization had recently reported urgent health decades as challenges for the next decade. We can see that these are related to the effects of climate change on health, access and availability to healthcare services, and preparedness for the infectious disease epidemics. Most importantly, if we can look at how we can be able to harness some of our new technologies, data and approaches, such as earth observation data, it can help us be able to strengthen some of our scientific communication as well as gain public trust. Next slide, please. There are an array of earth observation data that are collected from the low earth orbiting, or orbiting satellites. For example, we can use land temperature, vegetation, precipitation as part of the data that we can analyze along with our on the ground data sources and public health data. These all link with the One Health concept and these data are open access and available at earthdata.nasa.gov. Next slide, please. One of the organizations that I'd like to present today as a One Health Network is the GeoHealth Community Practice. And this serves as a global network of governments, organizations, and observers who seek to use Earth observation data to help enhance some of the health decision-making that we have across sectors and levels. We have bi-weekly teleconferences and in-person conferences, as well as contributions at the regional international level with the GEO Symposium and AmeriGeo Week within the region of the Americas. We also support work groups, which offers the opportunity to leverage expertise and connect individuals across the globe working in these important areas of environmental health, such as heat, infectious diseases, air quality, food security and safety, and healthcare infrastructure. We invite you to learn more about the GeoHealth Community Practice at our webpage, geohealthcop.org. Next slide, please. Throughout the pandemic, we had the opportunity to develop and coordinate COVID-19 teleconferences. These initially started with weekly teleconferences where we were aiming to leverage expertise across those earth and health scientists working on important topics to be able to bring them to a platform and discuss them. For example, does seasonality influence COVID-19 transmission? What are the impacts of air quality due to some of the lockdown restrictions? Those complex questions require transdisciplinary collaborations, and that's where One Health comes into play. Our next community telecon will be on February 28th, and we invite you to join this, this telecon. We have also had the opportunity, because of these teleconferences, to contribute to virtual symposiums of the group on Earth observations. As you can see, there are two from 2020 and 2021, which again is able to leverage this expertise across the globe and come together and develop sustainable action moving forward on COVID, but also on other emerging health issues of this next decade of action. We invite you to learn more on this website, earthobservations.org slash symposium 2020 or 2021.php. Next slide, please. So I'd like to share an example of where this can be used and again, be able to leveraging expertise across our One Health disciplines. So as we know, cholera is a challenging uh, envir environmental pathogen where we have an estimated 40 to 80 million people living in cholera hotspots in Africa. There's also a challenge with underreporting where there's about 1.4 to 4 million people who uh, potentially can have a cholera um, infection. So again, this underreporting remains a significant challenge, especially when we try to identify these high risk areas or predict them. And with this team led by Dr. Antar Jutla of the University of Florida, use public health data, including an array of earth observation data from satellites such as GPM, MODIS, MIRA2, and Ornal LandScan. And being able to use that with on the ground data, they were able to develop a cholera forecasting tool that was able to help inform cholera risk reduction in Yemen, Mozambique, and other African nations. Next slide, please. 
This is incredibly important, not only to be able to offer community outreach to those at-risk communities, which is extremely important for Yemen, which experienced the world's worst cholera outbreak in 2017, and Mozambique, which experienced two tropical cyclones together in the same period in 2019. This also offered the opportunity to leverage this expertise across different individuals, governments, as well as organizations, including UNICEF and the UK Department of International Development. These partnerships are key in our One Health community to be able to bring some of that expertise and bring to the communities who need that in the field. Next slide, please. Another benefit during the COVID-19 uh, pandemic in terms of One Health collaborations was the collaboration between NASA, the European Space Agency, and the Japanese Space Agency, which aimed to look at how the Earth systems were changing, especially throughout some of these lockdown measures. This dashboard, which is available at eodashboard.org, can allow you to look at different types of regions and countries, in particular to an array of indicators, economic, agriculture, air, water, and health. So please, we invite you to look and just and look a little bit more at this dashboard and, and with your curiosity. Next slide, please. And finally, how can we continue to become engaged in the One Health community? And in particular, how can this One Health network, as well as the others that we'll talk about today, support your public health applications related to emerging global health issues? And that can be as simple as attending teleconferences or annual meetings within your discipline and expanding to those of your colleagues. Being able to participate in small work groups. We're going to have some small work groups within the OHSS that you're welcome to join, as well as within this community of practice. There's an opportunity to look at different types of international groups, as well as training courses. Uh, within NASA, there's the NASA R set, which offer in real time, as well as archived um, webinars to be able to learn about how to be able to use, interpret, um, and other types of analysis to Earth observation data, and as well as different types of hackathons. So there's a lot of opportunities to be able to contribute your valuable expertise from your field to the One Health community. Again, we invite you to learn more about our GeoHealth community practice at geohealthcop.org. And thank you for this opportunity to form part of this esteemed panel. Thank you very much, Elena. So um, we will directly give the floor to uh, our next panelist, who is uh, Dr. Hans Kuhn. Please, the floor is yours. Yes, hello, everybody. Uh, thank you very much for inviting me and to share with you from Belgium some experience in uh, the Belgium One Health Network that we uh, initiated some time ago. My background as a political scientist is working with other disciplines mainly. So I have a background in the field of nature uh, in the Research Institute for Nature and Forests, which is a governmental research institute in Belgium uh, and also at the faculty of health sciences at the University of Antwerp. Uh, so I'm doing a lot of bridge building work and stretching my own uh, expertise and, and capacities as a social scientist. Uh, next, please. Ah, there it is, okay. <laughs> Uh, so, as I just mentioned, uh, the Belgium One Health Network, uh, of which Severin was also taking part in this initiating launching event, which you see on the left, uh, that took place just before COVID hit the world, so it was in November 2019, was initiated uh, by some people who uh, had been working together within Belgium, but also with some European partners, on uh, One Health uh, within Europe uh, and we already had a big meeting in 2016 uh, with the European network uh, and there already we tackled a lot of issues but we thought it worthwhile to uh, have a specific One Health network in Belgium and uh, the enthusiasm for that was actually quite big. You see on the right side you see a lot of different uh, logos of uh, organizations which you probably won't know uh, because they are mainly Belgium, but it's a combination of uh, different universities and scientific institutes and also of uh, NGOs uh, of uh, the health sector or the nature sector of 
uh, some other sectors even, the, also local governments and representatives of the federal and, and uh, regional governments were uh, included, uh, all having an interest in joining forces and networking on uh, one health and, and uh, top right you see our web link so if you are interested to find out uh, more detail about what i will present to you very quickly uh, please have a look there in the middle you see the outcomes well it, it's uh, part of the outcomes of uh, a survey which we organized during the COVID crisis so if you talk about our activities during the COVID crisis this was one of our main activities to uh, ask, to consult uh, our uh, yeah, community on uh, as aspects that were of great importance, challenges, lessons learned already uh, regarding One Health and its role, uh, uh, looking at what we all have been experiencing in, in the COVID uh, crisis. Next, please. And here you see a kind of a summary overview of uh, the main uh, outcomes of uh, this survey. And this also links quite nicely to previous experiences that we have uh, had as conclusions uh, of, of uh, bigger meetings uh, with, within the network. Uh, so it's very much in line with that, but this is a nice overview. And we distinguish uh, in yellow, yeah, the, the apparent need, which a lot of people still recognize that operationalization of this concept of One Health, however we define it, and there are different uh, perspectives on One Health, I think, uh, still uh, out there. Uh, operationalization, how to put it into practice and how to assess the quality of it, for example, is still, uh, yeah, pending and, and still needs a lot of work. Many things are happening. It's going very fast in development, I think, but there's clearly a need to exchange experiences and then to, to have some, some further methodological, but also uh, practical societal uh, debate about uh, how, how to do this. And then in blue, uh, we distinguish uh, some specific One Health challenges uh, that, uh, that come to the fore, and that's of course the integration of animal, human, plant and ecosystem health, which is a bit uh, sounding like almost the definition of uh, One Health. Uh, but also we notice uh, that there are, when we look at the linkages between nature and health, uh, two uh, almost separate communities out there. Uh, one community looking mainly at uh, nature-related health risks, like infectious diseases uh, uh, related to nature and, and COVID uh, could be an example of that. And another community mainly looking at the beneficial side of uh, nature contact, uh, the importance of green space in our uh, ever more urbanizing uh, world. Uh, and these two communities uh, are, are a bit uh, yeah, working next to each other, they are not well integrated, so that's also quite a an, an, an challenging integration uh, uh, ambition that we, we still uh, have to work on. And I think COVID brought these two communities also a little bit more together, especially also if you see the benefits of having green space during lockdown in these uh, yeah, urbanized uh, areas. And then finally, uh, also incorporating a view on the societal drivers, so the socio-economic, uh, cultural, uh, uh, more social science-related science uh, drivers uh, that also play an important role. And I think the structural one health uh, uh, concept uh, relates to that uh, very much. Uh, so these were yeah, really mentioned as uh, specific clusters of one health uh, challenges uh, that uh, were considered important and then some generic one health challenges that go beyond only the field or the sector or whatever you would like to call it of one health uh, and, and that's uh, the importance of working holistically having a systems an integrated systems approach uh, to do this in a collaborative uh, fashion and also to have uh, 
uh, attention for the enabling factors and they can be funding or policy uptake or policy support but they can also as well be uh, soft skills for example uh, that we all need in order to facilitate these uh, yeah, collaborative uh, uh, initiatives uh, better. Next slide please. So what have we been doing recently? Uh, well, we have been planning this uh, for longer. Uh, one of the main things we try to do is to have uh, big network events. Uh, in our experience, this works very well to bring people together, to bring a lot of knowledge together and to also have very relevant uh, discussions. Uh, to do this face to face is uh, of course difficult in the era of uh, COVID-19 so we have been postponing postponing but in the end we uh, decided to have our meeting in November and uh, uh, yeah because of the COVID situation in Belgium we had to do it online what was the topic of our meeting uh, that was uh, to consider the One Health perspective uh, on the European Green Deal. Now, maybe not all of you know it. Uh, I will not uh, fully explain it, but it's uh, the, the Green Deal of the European Union, in which they uh, bring together, as you can see, many, many challenges that have to do with our environment uh, and, and uh, with uh, the food system, the farm to fork, uh, climate change, uh, pollution, uh, etc., etc. We chose to, to focus on four uh, aspects of that that we considered uh, yeah, most, most easily to link to uh, uh, the One Health perspective, and that's achieving climate neutrality, uh, biodiversity, so preserving Europe, Europe's natural capital, uh, a circular economy, and again, the farm to fork uh, topic. So what we did was in preparation of this big meeting, uh, we had some expert consultations, of which also Severin took part, of course, uh, where we in four groups uh, invited specialists on the topic, but also some uh, specialists on One Health in general to already prepare on these topics uh, the bigger meeting and already start drafting some uh, draft recommendations that we could discuss uh, during our uh, conference in November. Uh, next slide, please. And it was a very well attended conference, lots of people uh, in yellow. On the, on the top left, you see uh, the, the web, the hyperlink uh, for that. So please have a, have a look uh, there. Uh, there's also uh, a nice uh, yeah, summarizing trailer of, of the meeting uh, made. Everything has been recorded. Also the PDFs of the presentations are there. It was a very interesting mix of these four topics, but also of both uh, representatives of uh, the European Union and representatives from Belgium, uh, from uh, yeah, this uh, expert uh, themes. And also, not unimportantly, uh, at the end of the meeting, four federal ministers also gave their view on the importance of One Health and also on the linkages to the EU Green Deal. So that's quite, uh, well, it, 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 it shows that it's of, of quite some uh, importance and, and gaining recognition as an important concept, uh, at least in Belgium, but I think we see this in many more uh, countries. Now, building on this meeting, uh, these draft recommendations that were uh, uh, presented uh, during the meeting uh, were put in an online survey. And currently, we are collecting and starting to analyze uh, the responses uh, of that. Uh, uh, and, and that will all together, because we yeah, are lacking a physical meeting, we could not have dialogue. So that's why we engaged in this survey consultation. Uh, this will all together result in recommendations to the Belgium government and also potentially of interest for uh, the European Union and, and maybe even uh, beyond. And uh, apart from these uh, thematic recommendations, we also had some cross-cutting recommendations, which on the next slide, please, 
uh, I just give you a glimpse of what we are we're talking about. And so we had some science-related uh, recommendations. We had we had more. We also had the policy and, and societal recommendations. But just to give you a glance of what we have been discussing. So uh, the need for uh, operationalizing and supporting trans transdisciplinary practice uh, oriented one health sciences you also see data sharing uh, integrating uh, a holistic one health approach in the curricula at universities more inter-university education initiatives etc so these are the things that we have been discussing and will uh, try to keep working on next slide please so this was is my last slide <laughs> just to thank you for your attention should you have any questions beyond of this meeting feel free to contact me and thanks a lot for listening thank you very much hans uh, and uh, yeah there are a lot of information and it's i really uh, ad uh, advise you to to get in and to go to all those uh link because everything is uh online um and then we have we will anyway have a discussion after the last presentation uh which is going to be with uh aurelie Bino. uh please aurelie the floor is yours okay thank you very much severine and uh, thank you so much for inviting me to this webinar um hello everybody i would like to to talk uh, to present you an experience um for a social scientist uh, in the coordination of a regional network that was aiming at uh, epidemiological risk management. Uh, so I, I decided to talk with you and just just make a, a storytelling, let's say, about uh, the, the coordination of this net network. So I would like you to imagine how was the situation 10 years ago. So we were uh, in Southeast Asia just after the second big, um, let's say, uh, crisis linked to avian flu uh, emergence. And so at this time, one else approach has really become some a, a, a reality for a lot of practitioners, for a lot of uh, decision makers also, for the international organizations. But yet it was still very difficult for it to really um, become a reality for researchers and at ground level with local stakeholders in the framework of um, surveillance systems. So this was um, kind of the, the purpose, let's say, of the GREES network. So GREES stands for Management of Emerging Risk in Southeast Asia. It is a regional research network, so it doesn't involve um, decision makers or practitioners, but only uh, university or research centers in six countries of uh, Southeast Asia. So basically uh, Thailand, Laos, Vietnam, Indonesia, uh, uh, sorry, Philippines, and I forgot one. Um, yeah, I, so, sorry, I don't have it anymore, but uh, we can go back and you Cambodge? can have Cambodia. Thank you so much, Severin. You are listening. It was a test. Thank you. <laughs> so um, I will uh, share in the chat uh, a bit later the, the, the web link to Green's network and also the Twitter. But um, what was uh, at play at this time is that first we had some previous research activities that were involving academics and non-academics and uh, fostering toward integrated approach to risk in this context of avian flu where we understood that uh, well, well say between um, animal health and human health for sure there were interactions to be addressed and to be addressed not only in terms of uh, policies and um, uh, let's say uh, interventions, but also to be addressed in the field of research and for academics, uh, but that we should go a bit further. And then we decided on the basis of what was existing in the ground in terms of uh, uh, training, participatory epidemiology training, workshops, and the setup of some research project fostering on um, H5N1 or FMD or even Sura disease in Southeast Asia. 
um, we we decided to go further with the the let's say the design of a bottom up community of thinking and community of practice that could go beyond you know a reductionist approach uh, beyond model disease so not only thinking in terms of um, disease management but really uh, trying step by step to 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 set the mind so we can really have a systems thinking approach and uh, step by step also bringing the people to think in terms of socio-ecological system rather than thinking in terms of disease animal disease or public health threat so this was the 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 purpose let's say of this network and in order to to break the the way the, the let's say the traditional conventional way of thinking uh, with all these people making the network who were uh, acad mainly academics in the fields of animal science the the fact that uh, an anthropologist uh, well in the it, it was me at that time uh, could with a total different way of thinking and a total different totally different uh, set of mind in terms of uh, addressing the risk not only in terms of um, biomedical uh, settings but in terms of um, perception of communities uh, fostering te also territor territorial approach territory approach it could really uh, make the difference for the setup uh, of this network uh, and so the main uh, the main levers let's say that we that we had to to do that was to let's say disseminate participatory approaches and principles so uh, highlighting which were the social factors driving behavior for the for the herders for example or for the farmers um, taking also into account what were the social cultural economical political patterns that were driving emergence also uh, working on risk representation and perceptions and also in the field of this participatory approach uh, going toward communities empowerment and setting the basis for collective actions and all this in the framework of projects that were designed to improve surveillance systems so for sure the core of the network and the core of the research activities and the research project and all the the activities that were funded by by our donors for sure it was yet on um, surveillance system or on control measures or prevention measures but in all these activities there was a special focus you know like a teaser uh, again and again and again about all these different elements regarding uh, perceptions and representations and all the things that could help the academics in animal health mainly to get out of the out of this set of mind thinking about the disease because uh, even at that time uh, in the framework of um, avian flu crisis there was really um, a big challenge for the the, the decision makers and the uh, international organizations such like uh, ye or fao it was to involve farmers uh, village heads and a lot of people from the civil society in the surveillance systems for example for the, re the reporting of um, of uh, uh, avian flu cases etc but uh, uh, this was made from uh, you know these people in uh, in uh, animal health science focusing on the disease and how the disease impacts farmers or herders or village heads changing the um, let's say changing the the the, the interface and uh, the, the support and bringing on the scene the model of socio-ecological systems instead of the model of disease for the elaboration of all the activities and uh, the conceptual framework for this project really could help step by step to to bring our colleagues from veterinary science and even from public health to think in terms of systems 
the systems being the socio-ecological system, the territory, the, the place where communities are living and experiencing the farming activities, etc. And it was really on the basis of this um, project with a bottom-up uh, methodology, let's say, that step by step in an iterative, inductive, and let's say time consuming for sure, but um, uh, still a functioning uh, approach that we could really build the, um, the competencies for systems think thinking. Because in one else approach for sure, systems thinking are cold everywhere, all the time. We talk about transdisciplinary approach, systems thinking, uh, all these things, but experiencing it in real, at local level, with the with the animal health officers, with uh, our colleagues, uh, researchers from the the, the faculties in uh, veterinary science, etc., is really challenging because it involves for them to deeply change their set of mind. So it was really the, the purpose of this research network, and maybe also in the context of Southeast Asia ten years ago after the avian flu crisis, it was maybe the added value of Greece network because at that time and still now there is there are plenty research network and uh, uh, t uh, t uh, think tank and a lot of communities of practice etc but this one 10 years ago was as this originality really going step by step building a systems thinking uh, competency and uh, also we decided to to work on different uh, you know, uh, access for, for research. So we had uh, a focus on the interactions between biodiversity and health, uh, working on the uh, rodent-borne disease, for example, and uh, seeing how agriculture, uh, with uh, all the change that agriculture is, um, is, is impacting on the, on the land use, uh, how it modifies biodiversity and how then it can bring with a, a eco, health ecology uh, uh, approach, we can then understand how it can bring to the emergence of some disease. We had also another uh, axe of thinking, really focusing on participatory approach to health management and on the development of methodology. And that's why social science was really a kind of lever to, to, to go further within, within Greece Network because we could bring some uh, clues and some keys in terms of uh, unlocking the, the, the approach for uh, working with local uh, stakeholders and uh, providing some methodology uh, guidelines from the, the colleagues, from academics or non-academics that wanted to, to work uh, inside this participatory approach uh, and framework. And uh, going a bit further uh, and maybe um, reflecting on the COVID-19 crisis, but I don't know if it is the time to do it now, Severino, or do you prefer that we address these questions maybe later uh, in the discussion? But no, no, please go ahead because the others already have tackled this question okay. so you can go yeah. like this we can go to the second question when when you okay finish. okay perfect so uh reflecting on the covid 19 crisis i think that uh the 10 years of experience with this greece uh greece network uh, regional research network has really uh, built capacities for systems thinking for transdisciplinary approach that is absolutely necessary now to to well to address COVID-19, but not only COVID-19, also to think about uh, uh, disease X, the, the, the next one that will probably come uh, at one time, but also to, to reinforce deeply. And again, I, I insist on this, but it is really from the practice. It is uh, from, the, from the activities at bottom level, that uh, there is no uh, capacity to negotiate and to collaborate with local stakeholders. And then it can lead to the, let's say, a negotiation of some change in practice that will be needed in order to prevent uh, from some risks. 
for example, in some areas of Cambodia where um, the farmers are really uh, in uh, close contact with uh, some bats, uh, potentially, uh, you know, transmitting disease like uh, Nipah virus. Uh, the change in practice that will lead to a reduction of uh, contact between uh, bats and human could really be addressed not only with a, you know, um, a top-down approach from, uh, you know, public health officers coming in the village and telling the people what to do, but could be arising from some experience. For example, we developed um, uh, role-playing games where farmers can experience how some choices in terms of um, agricultural practice, farming practice, and for example, collecting guano from bats, for example, can lead to uh, uh, an, an increase in the risk factor and the risk exposition, and then can lead to some uh, uh, people of the family getting sick. So all these approach that are really, uh, you know, participatory, bottom up, and uh, very simple, in, in fact, but can really make the difference for a better cooperation between local stakeholders, uh, local decision makers or uh, high level decision makers also, and academics that are addressing these um, these treats in, in the field in the, the framework of one else approach. And uh, it can really make the difference because now all these academics have some tools and resource that enable them to work with the local stakeholders differently maybe than before. And that is, I think, the the most important contribution of social science to Greece network, even if, unfortunately, the, the, main, uh, the main purpose of the intervention of social scientists in, uh, in Greece network was really about facilitating, about, uh, you know, uh, te not teaching, but uh, proposing some trainings and uh, some, uh, some, well, so, some way to, to have a uh, an, an learning of participatory approach and methodologies, rather than really implementing uh, health anthropology or health sociology uh, study, that for sure are very needed also. But the, the first purpose was really about coordinating and inputting the most possible systems thinking and uh, systems approach within uh, the, the practice of uh, health risks management. And I think that's it so far. <laughs> that's already a lot. Uh, so thank yeah. you very much, Aurélie. So now we uh, already are almost 10 minutes away from the end of, um, of our webinar. Uh, we can stay longer, of course. So, uh, like I said, you, the three of you already discussed about the contribution of your uh, One Health Network during the COVID-19. So, I will ask you, uh, how uh, do you envision now the future of your One Health Network over the next five years, for instance? So, I don't know who from uh, the panel would like to start answering this question. Severine, it's Aurélie, maybe just yeah. in the continuation of what I just said, I think the, now the next step is really to integrate social scientists not only in the posture of coordination and facilitation, uh, but also uh, in order to, to yes, to, to implement uh, anthropological studies that will for sure uh, highlight key drivers for, for disease management. And uh, at this time, Greece Network is focusing on a big challenge of um, uh, antibiotic uh, resistance. And, in, and there, I think social scientists will be needed uh, not only to, to train uh, other, uh, other colleagues, but also to, to, get, uh, to, to get some, uh, some data that will be absolutely necessary to, to co-design uh, the, the policies and um, the interventions. Yeah, I, uh, I fully agree. Uh, Elena or Hans, would you like to react or add? 
So I can share a comment. Uh, yeah, um, I thank you for the other presentations. Um, as far as the GeoHealth community of practice, um, really the continued efforts to connect communities of diverse disciplines, so from the earth science community, the health science community, other social science communities, to be able to leverage that expertise that can effectively bridge robust collaborations to investigate these pressing global health issues that we're seeing now and that we will continue to see. Um, especially when we look at utilizing new technologies, which include data, products, approaches, and, and uh, analytical techniques to be able to advance some of this health decision making that we have across the board. The World Health Organization urged global solidarity where governments, communities, and international agencies um, should collaborate on initiatives to achieve some of the critical goals that they've um, that they've reported for the next 10 years of this decade of action. So the continued bridging of these disciplines over the next five years will be crucial, um, obviously with focus on the COVID pandemic, but also looking at other issues that are coming, the effects of climate change, looking at heat, looking at air quality. Um, and again, the social science disciplines are one of those valuable contributions to that platform. Yeah, I take the occasion to look at already a question from the audience. And I find a nice, interesting question. Um, well, it's a bit uh, not directly related, but it's true. So Luis Maya uh, from Brazil is asking how hard it is sometimes to have social scientists from different backgrounds themselves uh, talking the same language. And also, yeah, we like to reflect on that, that for instance, transdisciplinary approach uh, or uh, action, research action and so on are not something especially that we got as social scientists uh, directly. And also here we can see that we have political um, scientists, eco environmentalist scientists. And yeah, so I don't know if also you want to, to react on, on, on that. Uh, yeah, maybe if I may respond. Uh, in the very recent experience, we are trying with an international group to uh, design a research uh, project proposal for the European Union. And in fact, uh, in this uh, group of experts, uh, social science is considered of great importance also by, by the epidemiologists and the, and the vets, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So they seem to recognize uh, the importance, and on, let's say a kind of ambition level, they are open to it. But when you go into the details, they sometimes feel uncomfortable. But to respond to your question, what I also sense is that between me and some other social, <coughs> so, sorry, social scientists that are involved in this. Uh, uh, research proposal uh, design, we also sometimes seem to have uh, different views. For example, should we build our own island of expertise and uh, try to do our own work properly because else uh, it will be messed up by uh, yeah, natural scientists or whatever, or do we try to integrate uh, more and, and try to, to dance together instead of uh, creating your own house or your own island? And, and I sense in this, this uh, personal experience already that uh, there are completely different takes on how to uh, relate uh, social science to one health. Some uh, just don't want to do any uh, uh, concession uh, to their expertise and want to do uh, what they consider best science from a social scientific perspective. Whereas me personally, I rather do some concessions, but uh, try to collaborate with the others and try to build something together, which also relates a little bit, I think, if I understand you or really to what you try to do, eh, to, to, to have this really uh, inter and transdisciplinary collaboration. Uh, but it seems that even within the group of social scientists, at least this is one divide that you sometimes uh, can notice. Yeah, can can I answer to to, to Hans about this? Yeah, of course. Yeah, I, I think you are absolutely right, Hans, because uh, in the community of social scientists, we can also have a um, reductionist uh, approach, for sure. And uh, sometimes it is more easy 
for social social scientists fostering integrated approach to work with, for example, a, a modeler, uh, people in the field also of ecology. But uh, yeah, I really think it is a posture that is very uh, compatible to some social science, uh, let's say, conceptual framework and uh, epistemological framework. But uh, it can also be very, very difficult to involve social scientists in this integrated approach. And rather than talking about social science uh, or I mean participatory approach, integrated approach is not only about social science. It is something you are right, Hans, that that should really be uh, underlined uh, very, very strongly here. It is uh, it is something that that deals with of course, involving social actors out of the academic, but uh, it, it's not enough. Uh, we need other other perspective also. Yeah, and in that uh, direction, because you already mentioned some recommendation, uh, Elena, do you have also additional recommendation to better integrate social science in the One Health research? I think that um, that there are many recommendations already present, maybe just to reflect on our own disciplines and think about what our familiar toolkit is. Um, what is our go-to when we think about doing a project or community initiative? And think about what other sources can help us find different answers within the community to keep that innovation uh, moving forward. Because as we integrate various data sources, and again, speaking outside of our typical jargon as the question, the original question was asking, um, that's where we can develop some of these interventions that can facilitate that translation of knowledge to community practice from our own fields um, and, and build robust collaborations with other disciplines. So again, think about what your familiar toolkit is um, and what's missing. Where is that research or practice gap in your field that you're going to need that expertise of someone outside of your field to provide that guidance? Yeah. Uh, so I don't know if we can, if uh, from the audience, there are some additional questions. I, uh, I see uh, a question, is there any global networking platform for promoting of One Health concept, especially for low-income economies? Uh, if, uh, we, if we have an idea uh, of that, we can maybe add on the chat. I think EcoHealth is trying to do that a little bit. Eh? EcoHealth yeah. is, of course, another term or word or label than One Health. But, uh, for example, in Europe, we have initiated a European chapter of EcoHealth, but it's actually uh, built from a One Health initiative. So uh, there's lots of overlaps, but I think EcoHealth has a bit more affinity and history in uh, these regions of the work and doing this kind of uh, connections uh, so maybe that could be of value to have a look at but i think these days there's quite some uh, how do you call it parallel uh, conceptual developments and communities growing related to it uh, that uh, it's sometimes difficult to to see where is one health or where is another concept uh, actually coming from or mainly related to uh, but this is just how it goes uh, humans try to do many things together. So. <laughs> yeah, and, and Cheryl from uh, the One Health Commission has also some information regarding that. Uh, hi, Severine. This is uh, Cheryl Stroud, Executive Director of the One Health Commission. Thank you guys so much for organizing this. Um, that's a really great question. We have a huge need to connect all of those uh, around the world who understand this concept and are trying to work to help the rest of the world understand it. So there's a need for us to, it's unacceptable that the One Health movement that is supposed to defragment us is so fragmented. So one of the things that the commission has been working on for about seven years now is um, some who's who in One Health organizations maps. And I have just put into the chat box a link to those maps, which we have just recently updated. Um, 
like everything, the pandemic really um, inhibited our ability to stay on top of that. And we'll be putting a message out to our listserv, which we call our Global One Health Community listserv. Um, that's like 15,700 people strong now. And we'll be putting a message out um, pointing out that these um, web pages have been updated and asking, uh, asking the world, the Global One Health community, to make us aware of any that we've missed or others that need to be highlighted and maybe connect us with those organizations. So just make you aware that that resource is available and thank you for that, um, thinking about that. Thank you, Cheryl. Uh, I think the time is running out, so if I will leave the floor again to the panelists, if you have a last word to say, otherwise I will go to the last slide with some uh, practical information for the way forward of our activities. Well, as a closing, um, thank you everyone for attending and for my inspirational panelists on this um, exciting event today. But just to leave this webinar thinking that your con your contributions, your training, your expertise is extremely valuable to the One Health community. And being able to build those bridges is what we need now moving on to this decade of action and continue to move forward as we look at some of those endemic and epidemic concerns um, as we continue uh, trying to promote community health across our globe. So again, your expertise is extremely valuable to this global platform. Thank you. And Hans, I saw you wanted to say something. Yeah, what just came to my mind, of course, everybody heard that there are many determinants of health, but I think you could say the same about One Health. Eh? So there's so many things happening and trying to cover it all in one big initiative. Uh, well, maybe that's not even the most important and sometimes equivalent uh, concepts arise uh, that, that more or less try to do the same uh, personally i just accept it as something which is just how uh, people uh, yeah organize uh, themselves but most importantly is to keep thinking about what you really want to do with it so a concept as such means nothing if you don't have a clear understanding among each other what you uh, yeah, ambition with it and, and what you would like to achieve. Eh? So keep discussing it and keep uh, uh, yeah, uh, trying to put it into practice. That would be my last words. And I think it's perfect. Thank you. Thank you so much. Uh, I will then just conclude with this last slide by mentioning uh, that if you want, you can request a certificate of participation to this webinar. So here you have the information. Uh, if you want to contact personally the speakers, you have their email address. And uh, also we will have our next webinar on March uh, 8. Um, it's going to be about our small work groups who are going to present their plan and framework for uh, their coming activities. So please don't hesitate to already register. So I put the link there. And then, uh, yeah, here it's our uh, website link so where you can have updates and announcements of our activities. Thank you very much, all of you. Uh, I hope to uh, very soon reorganize a new a series of networks meeting together and continue to, to build on all the experiences that we can share um, to have a, a better world. Voila, thank you very much to all and I will now stop the, the recording and uh, leave the yeah online session. Uh, well, I will cut the, the webinar, I know what to say. <laughs> so, thank you, bye-bye. Yeah, bye-bye. Bye. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.